Hello. Welcome to 2021 and welcome to the Environmental Science Center's first virtual beach walk where we are fortunate to have a handful of naturalists out on the beach this evening at Seahurst Park in Burien, Washington. We're so fortunate to have this annual event happening even in this way through the sponsorship from the King County Flood Control District, Ryan Ein and the Shin Yuen Foundation to help share with people what's happening in their watershed and all the great things that are happening with these marine systems. So if you aren't on the beach tonight, that's okay. You're still on the beach in a way and we're hoping that you can interact with us, ask some questions. I'm Carly Rose and I will be monitoring some of these questions. If you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. If you're on Facebook, you can just type some things in uh, to the comment section and we will try to relay those to our naturalists on the beach. And I also have a virtual naturalist here as well. My name is Alyssa. I am obviously working from home tonight. Um, I'm gonna be supplementing what our naturalists on the beach find, adding some extra photos and video clips. Um, and of course we have our naturalists on the beach as well. Hello, hello, my name is Rosie. I am a naturalist in the Environmental Science Center. I'm one of four naturalists we have here out on the beach. They'll all get a chance to introduce themselves kind of when they take turns on camera as we find different organisms and want to talk about them. And right now we're up at the top of the beach. You can see some of these logs behind me. And even sort of behind that, you might be able to see some grasses. This is sort of a, a wetland area near the top of the beach. This is right where the seawall used to be. And I know Alyssa is gonna talk about that in a second, but also before we go any further, since we are here out on site on the beach, we do wanna take a minute to acknowledge the fact that we are on indigenous land. We are on the traditional land of various Coast Salish peoples, including the Duwamish and the Muckleshoot tribes. And we honor with gratitude the land itself, as well as these tribes. And not only are we grateful for their past stewardship since time immemorial, they've been living on and caring for this land, but also we're so grateful for current indigenous science and research and knowledge that helps us to know more about and understand this incredible ecosystem. And we, of course, honor the future generations to come that we get to work and study alongside. So I know Alyssa wanted to tell you a little bit more about the story of the beach here. And she's going to talk a little bit more about that as we start we here on the beach uh, move, start to move down, move down the beach towards the water and take you to our first organism. All right, uh, thanks Rosie. Um, so first, I just want to start out, normally when we do these moonlight beach walks, we would start out by passing out some field guides to everyone, some laminated copies. We can't do that tonight, um, but I just wanted to take a minute to direct you to our website, um, environmentalsciencecenter.org, where you can download your own field guide at home. Um, so if you do want to head there at the top of our page, you can click on public events head down to the Moonlight Beach Walks 2021. And when you get to that page, towards the bottom, kind of partway down the page, you'll see this field guide that you can just click on, download at home so that you can follow along tonight and use in the future. Um, this time of year, the lowest low tides in our region are kind of in the middle of the night. Um, so it's pretty chilly, but especially as we get into the spring and summer, I encourage you to save that field guide, go out and explore on your own. Um, so as Rosie mentioned, uh, there has been a seawall at uh, Seahurst since the early 70s. So I just wanted to go into a little bit of the history of Seahurst and um, the shoreline armoring. Um, it was actually the biggest shoreline restoration project in the whole Puget Sound. 
Um, and the seawall was originally put in in the early 70s in order to stop erosion of the beach and to give us more kind of land set aside for a nice park, uh, which was a great idea, but it wasn't completely thought through because the seawall actually increased the erosion on the beach. And over the 30-ish years that the full seawall was intact, the beach actually sank around three to four feet. So a project began in 2004 and it was funded by um, state and local and federal funding to remove that beach wall and restore that habitat to it's uh, something closer to the natural state. And so quite a bit of work um, was done. A thousand feet of shoreline were removed and returned to that natural state. Sand and gravel were brought in to replenish the beach. And finally, this link between the terrestrial ecosystems and those marine ecosystems was reopened. The beach had been starved of nutrients and sediment for decades. And by removing uh, the seawall and um, reopening this connection and adding in lots of native plants along the walkway, it not only made the park, I think, even more beautiful, um, but also just a much better, richer habitat by restoring that um, connectivity. And we're already starting to see so many different changes. The project um, completed in 2014. And so there's still a long way to go. We're still seeing changes now, um, but the eelgrass is doing so much better. There are forage fish returning to the beach, which are such an important food source uh, for the salmon that I think we all care about so much. So it's been um, quite a success story. And uh, hopefully we will see some of the benefits of that tonight in all the sea life that our naturalists will be finding on the beach. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to our um, naturalists on the beach so that they can give us a STARS stewardship message. Hello. Can you see me? Yes, you are good to go. Hi, Rosie. Oh, okay, good. I just can't see myself. I can't see what I am seen. Uh, I see that because Alyssa wanted to show us the the star stewardship message. Excellent. Well, as long as you tell me that I'm in frame, I'll just keep talking. Um, so we have found our first organisms. We're about to get to know them a little bit better, but it's the perfect time to review how we want to behave on the beach and how we want to interact with these organisms. So we have this handy mnemonic, a handy way to remember this beach etiquette, as we like to call it, and that's using the acronym STARS, which stands for step carefully. We want to walk very slowly, gently, and carefully as we step along the beach because we know that there are things living everywhere. When we touch these organisms, we want to touch very gently. And we always want to use two wet fingers. We like to use two fingers so that way we're not tempted to poke at these creatures. And also I really think that using two fingers means that I can get a better feel of the texture of these organisms because often their texture is so interesting. And we want to make sure that our fingers are wet because these organisms, they're they're meant to be wet. Their bodies are wet and cool from the water from Puget Sound, just right over there. So the fact that our fingers are wet, or, or when our fingers are not wet, if they're dry and warm, that means that that can actually be really harmful to these organisms. And it's so different from what their bodies want to be. So we get our fingers wet, touch them gently. The next letter is A, which stands for animals stay where you find them meaning that we don't want to ever pick up or move these creatures one because just because if we drop them that could really hurt right even such a small little crab falling a couple feet is like me falling off the space needle which i don't want to do and also even if we don't drop them if we move them so carefully even if we're moving them just a couple feet that's so far from where they want to be the beach is actually a lot of small habitats that can be really different from each other. 
So an organism really has found the spot it exactly wants to be, and we don't want to move them because we don't know exactly what they need like they do. The R stands for remove only trash, meaning as tempting as it is, we don't want to take home any beautiful shells or rocks. I know I'm always finding beautiful rocks on the beach. We really want to leave all of those things here because even those things that aren't alive are still a part of the habitat. Those rocks and those empty shells are still contributing to the habitat. They can be a home for other things, as we'll see lots of times out here tonight. And also, those shells will dissolve, and the nutrients that make them up will go back into the habitat. So we want to not take those things home. The only thing we want to take off the beach is trash, is any garbage that we find which of course we'd want to remove really safely. So the last one, definitely not the least, but very important is to share what we learn. That's part of why we're, we're not just exploring out here by ourselves tonight is that we're, we're talking to you, we're broadcasting to you because we really love this place and want to share about it, share all these exciting things that we're going to find and share how to interact with them, share this etiquette. So we hope that you will be excited to share and talk about all of the things that we find tonight. So that brings us to the first thing that we found. <laughs> uh, Alyssa, Carly, could you switch the screen so I could see what the camera is seeing so I make sure that we're pointed right at the thing we want? <laughs> Excellent. Oh no, I'm frozen. Uh-oh, that's not good. We might need to reset our little Wi-Fi booster thing. What? Oh my gosh. Uh-oh. Our screen is totally frozen. Oh, and I can't hear. You're not frozen to us though. Oh really? That's great. Yeah. What do you see? Tell me what I you see. I see you moving and hear you clearly. Okay, um, what happens if I switch the camera? Now, now I can see? see, I think there's water and lights across the way. Perfect, excellent. So you just tell me because I can't see what we're seeing. We are trying to show you yeah, this incredible we see some, rock some interesting covered things. There in we go. barnacles. <laughs> well, it really is hard for me to know what you're seeing <laughs> because I only see a frozen image of myself. Um, yeah, okay. Jackie has an idea for us to turn our camera off for a moment and turn it back on. Aha! Excellent. A lot of our other naturals are a lot more, more experienced in our field equipment than I am, which I'm very grateful for. So, what we're seeing here is a rock that is covered in barnacles. Jackie, do you think you could point at just one barnacle so we could get a sense of how small they are? A single particle is right there. Oh my gosh. Let's actually back those flashlights off just a little bit. Because I think that having a slightly lower light is a little bit better. Jackie and Alyssa can tell me how how we're doing, how it's coming across to you. But so we see there's just one barnacle there. So if I had to even estimate how many barnacles were on this whole rock, I don't even know, hundreds? hundreds at least maybe thousands which is pretty exciting mm. now we're gonna slowly well first i'll, I'll mm. stop here i'll pause here and ask if there are any particular questions about barnacles oh i see that Alyssa is gonna share us share with us some information about barnacles yeah i just wanted to share a few pictures there's a few different types of barnacles um, at seahurst as well and you can see um, in one of these pictures in particular there is a giant barnacle that has got lots of little barnacles living on its shell which is pretty cool to see and a pretty common sight um, in the inner title everything kind of piggybacks on top of everything else to capitalize on, you know, what little space there is. 
Uh, but I also wanted to share a really cool video of some barnacles actually eating. So you might know if you are lucky enough to find some barnacles underwater at high tide or in a tide pool, you can actually see them eating and coming out of their little shells so you can see them sticking their little feet out into the water to grab some plankton. So barnacles actually spend their whole life upside down doing a headstand with their head glued to the rock inside their shell. And those are their little feet that you can see grabbing food out of the water, which is pretty cool. All right, it looks like um, we're still setting up on the beach there. And barnacles are definitely one of the first things um, that we find, I think, every time we explore the beach. But uh, they're definitely also one of the coolest things on the beach. They are related to crabs and lobsters, uh, some of which I hope we find some shore crabs or some red rock crabs tonight. Um, those barnacles are kind of like cousins to them. So they have a hard shell in the same way. And they also molt or kind of drop that shell off of their body when they get too big for it. So we might find some crab molts later and we can um, explore that. But it looks like we've got a new discovery, some new animals on the beach. What did you guys find? Looks like we may have lost them, oh. but, oh. Sorry, no, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Just <laughs> muted. Discovery. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I promise this isn't the first time I've, I've used Zoom. Yeah, so we found an incredible gathering of dog whelks, which are a kind of marine snail. You'll notice their curling spirally shells. Oops, I didn't mean to poke you there, a little dog whelk. Um, which are very similar to the, sorry, oh, and I just said, I did what I said we shouldn't do, which is use one finger, two, two fingers. Um, they look very similar to snails you might find in your garden or well, at, out at a park. Oh, that was really on the move. They don't like that I jostled them. But so these dog whelks are gathered here to do something very important. And that is to, lay and fertilize their mm. eggs. Shoot. You can see these, gosh, I'm, I wish I could try to get you a little bit closer. I might try taking the iPad off the stand in just a second and get you closer. But I really want to show you all of these little sort of yellowish white grain, things that look like little grains of rice are all those dog whelk eggs so they are gathered all over this rock to have babies oh my gosh and i see another creature over there that i have to introduce you to i wanted to share a couple uh photos of those dog walks too i've got some close-ups here um so you can see they come in lots of different colors and patterns uh, but they're all those dog whelk snails and on the right side the second picture you can see that big red rock crab kind of hiding under the rock there with lots of dog whelk eggs all around him um so these are especially a common sight uh in the spring and even into the early summer, but you'll find these, they look like little grains of rice, um, but it's just thousands and thousands of little dog walk babies. All right, so I'm, I'll try to move very slowly and carefully, but I really wanted to get you close to these incredible eggs. Ooh, Kelly, could you hold the light up like above? Yeah, there they are. And I'm going to move very slowly, pan to the right. We have a chitin friend. Yeah, I'm going to move slowly and then just hold still again. Oh, excellent. Elizabeth, I hope you are ready to show us more about our friends here. Let's see if I can get you even 
There we go. What a beauty here. Um, Kelly, could you slowly move a finger in, or two two fingers, of course, to give us a little sense of scale here? For our mossy chitin. Excellent. Ex Yeah, there are a few different types of chitin that you can find um, at Seahurst. They're a type of snail, but they've got eight shells along their back. Um, and there are mossy chitons and hairy chitons. Um, and you can see there's some, um, some smooth species of chitin as well. And they're definitely one of my favorite animals to spot. I know kiddos that we work with love finding them because they are such amazing camouflagers. They're so good at blending in. Sometimes they're right in front of you, um, but it is the perfect uh, kind of defense against predators to just really look like, you know, a blob of moss on the rock. And they just kind of cruise around all day. They've got special tongues like most snails um, that are called radulas. So they've actually got hard little teeth on their tongue that they use to scrape along the rock, kind of like a little lawnmower. They just cruise around eating algae all day. And Alyssa, I see, and even on the rocks and in these photos, the chitons are surrounded by barnacles. We had a question from Karen uh, asking, are barnacles plants or animals? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they, you know, they seem like a plant in a lot of ways just because they don't, they don't move, um, but they are cousins to crabs and other crustaceans. So they start out their life um, as plankton. So they're actually free floating in the water with all the other plankton and they go through a metamorphosis, kind of like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Um, but their metamorphosis involves them growing some glue on their head and their head gets so heavy that eventually they fall over and they uh, stick on to one of those rocks and they grow into that adult form. So they actually end up eating little tiny plankton, little creatures that are swimming around in the water. So they are carnivores, um, they are animals. They just uh, stick around in one spot for their whole life. Wherever they end up gluing their head, that's where they're gonna spend their days. Great question. Wow. Great. Well, Alyssa, thanks for sharing all of that great knowledge. Um, I am naturalist Jackie. Y'all haven't met me yet, so thanks for joining us out here at Seahurst Beach. Um, we have found another creature here if we're ready to look at something new. So we were just looking at dog whelks. And whelks are in a group of animals called mollusks, and they are typically soft-bodied animal with a hard shell on the outside. Uh, but we found another kind of mollusk here. It is a type of sea slug or nudibranch. So, uh, oops, a little too much. <laughs> um, so it is a soft-bodied animal here. Uh, but they are lacking the shell that most of our other mollusks have. So um, it is, it looks like it's in a shell. It is in its, um, in this little sort of um, clamshell petri dish uh, because our sea slugs uh, need to be in water. It's very important for them to maintain their structure and their body to stay in water. Uh, their bones our basic or their structure, they're kind of like how we have bones. Uh, they have a hydrostatic skeleton or a water skeleton. Um, so they need to stay in a bit of water. So we're going to look at them from this little natural petri dish here. Mm, they're really trying to get out because <laughs> they don't, they don't want to hang out with us. I can't blame them. I wish we could. Tiny mouse is the coolest because it eats anemones. Oh yeah, the yeah. So, so our our snails, our mollusks, are animals that usually protect themselves with a shell. But because our sea slugs don't have shells, they've had to figure out other ways to protect themselves. So this little slug here, 
eat things like anemones. Uh, maybe we've um, heard of anemones before. Maybe after this, Alyssa can share some images to see what I'm talking about, if maybe we're unfamiliar. But they'll eat anemones, and they'll take their ability to sting, and then they can use those stinging cells for themselves to help keep off predators. So keep out things that might try and eat them. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm so glad that you guys found a nudibranch. I just wanted to share um, a, a another nudibranch um, that we found earlier on. Um, the, the bigger animal in this picture is a moon snail. Um, and kind of the sub picture within the picture within the picture here is uh, some of those moon snail eggs. And a really good tip if you are a fellow nudibranch or sea slug lover on the beach is you can gently kind of peek under these moon snail eggs that you'll find on the beach. And oftentimes there's a nudibranch who is snacking away on those eggs. And so in this picture, you can see it's a little opalescent nudibranch, which like the shaggy mouse also um, will eat stinging creatures like sea anemones and steal their stinging cells. They love to eat hydroids, a cousin of the sea anemones. And um, they're able to protect themselves even without a shell, like Jackie mentioned. Very cool. And we have some other cool questions. Um, can we can we state again what kind of nudibranch that was? Was it a shaggy that was found? And also, if if this is a big nudibranch, the uh, Carol was saying that some have been seen in the summertime, but they were only a quarter of an inch long. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Um, yeah, so that was a shaggy mouse nudibranch. And I would say that that is sort of a medium-sized sea slug. Um, there are lots that can be small, maybe even as small as your like pinky fingernail. So they can be incredibly small, and that's as big as they'll get. Um, and there are some that you can probably wrap your arms around, things like a giant black sea hare. Um, can get quite large. So, so sea slugs can range from very, very tiny to quite big. Awesome. We're looking at another little pool of water here. And I want us to all take some time to observe and see if you can see anything moving around in this little, this little pool, this little puddle. Take a minute to observe. Yeah, maybe I can try and point a few of those things out here. So in our little puddle, it looks like we have some shrimp that are swimming around here. And shrimp are actually pretty closely related to those barnacles we saw earlier. Um, they're in the same group of animals. They have a hard skeleton on the outside, um, and they're almost like a mini lobster. They got this long tail in the back that they can swim with, or they can use their legs and walk around. So when we're seeing them move a little bit quicker, you see those little darts of them moving around. They're using that tail in the back to swim backwards. get one in one of our containers. Yeah, maybe, let's see if we can try and get a little bit closer look using uh, sort of our, our version of a Petri dish. Um, so we'll make sure to keep our critter in the water because again, they like to be in that cold Puget Sound water. Uh, we'll see if we can get one to kind of jet into our cup instead of away from it. <laughs> kind of scare them in like, like you would a crawdad. <laughs> While you guys are working on that, um, I'm going to share a close-up photo. Uh, I think they are saying no thank you. So you'll often um, see amphipods and shrimp um, in the tide pools. It's especially um, kind of easy to almost spot their glow at night. So this is what they look like when you check them out under the microscopes. So you can definitely see um, what Jackie was talking about with them being crustaceans. They definitely look very lobster um, or shrimp-like. And we do have a video of one under a 
a microscope. So we'll see if that'll work for us. So you can see them kind of move around here. And there's actually a molt of one in the picture as well. So it looks like kind of a translucent copy is actually the old shell of one um, that outgrew their exoskeleton and kind of popped out of it to grow a new one. It's like, it's like uh, if you had a suit of armor when you were a baby, you would not be able to fit into that same suit of armor as an adult. You'd need to get a new one, grow a new one. I'm happy to also take that course. I feel like it's Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so we've been outwitted by our little shrimp here. They did not want to enter our, our Petri dish. Um, so we're going to leave them in their puddle of water. But while we were looking at that, we found a shell next to our little puddle here. And there is something that you might notice on this shell. So this is a clam shell. Um, it is the two sides, but nobody's home, nothing's inside. And if you look right here, this might tell us why we don't have anyone inside anymore. There's sort of this little drill hole. And uh, maybe if you're walking around on the beach, oh, here's another one. You might find these shells with this perfect little drill hole and you're like, great, look at that. Nature made a shell necklace for me. Um, but that little drill hole is from one of our animals that we've already seen, potentially one of our animals we've already seen, or a close relative of it. Uh, things like our dog whelks have this really cool tongue that they can use like a drill, so they can drill into their food, things like this clam here, and get to all the soft, good, squishy parts on the inside to eat it. So this shell is really great protection, but if the snail can get that really hard tongue, we call a radula, they can drill into their shell and get to their food. Now this one's a little bit bigger, so it might be from a little bit bigger snail called a moon snail. And so far I haven't seen any out here. They like to stay underwater a little bit more and under the sand, but um, Alyssa, if you have a, any images of a moon snail, maybe we can see how big these these snails can get to make these big drill holes in our in our clam shells here. Yeah, so here um, is a picture of a moon snail uh, that we saw a little bit earlier. Um, but like Jackie mentioned, they usually will be underneath the sand or in the water. You can see that big kind of beige shell on top and then that kind of peachy, pinky, squishy looking part is the actual animal. Um, and this one is actually partially pulled back into its shell. When they are fully out of their shell, they're even bigger. Um, but if they do feel threatened, they will kind of squeeze out water. They'll squirt that water out and pull all the way inside their shell. And they have a hard plate on their head that's made of the same calcium carbonate, that same hard material that their shell is. And that's called the operculum. And it's like a little trap door. And once they pull all the way inside their shell, that is the last part that will kind of pop into place, sealing them inside. And their shell is incredibly hard. I've seen birds picking them up and trying to drop them and crack the shell. And really a moon snail shell is especially thick, especially strong. Um, and like Jackie said, they're really a fierce predator. You might not think of a snail as a fierce predator, but they will cruise around, they will find that clam and they will just drill straight through the shell with their special tongue. Um, and they will squirt all their digestive juices straight into the shell of the clam and then just kind of slurp out that clam smoothie. So not the best table manners, but it definitely gets the job done. Thank you for that um, detailed description. And I'm wondering if you can answer a question from JD about moon snails being native, wondering if they're native to Puget Sound here. They are native um, to Puget Sound. There are a few um, relatives. There are definitely more than a few relatives that are not native. I do have a picture of one, um, not a snail, but another mollusk that is really common um, around here that is not a native species. So I'll get that pulled up. 
Um, so on the right side of this picture, it's that beautiful purple clamshell. That's a um, mahogany or varnish clam or purple clam, lots of different common names. Um, but that is an invasive species um, that is taking up space on our beaches and out competing other clams. Some beaches around here, it's the most common shell um, that I find. Um, so yeah, that <clears throat> is an unfortunate invasive species that came over, I believe from Japan. Um, but yes, moon snails are native. They are the biggest snail in this region. Um, definitely one of my favorite animals uh, to find on the beach. Well, related to that too, um, Sue is asking, other than their shell, do clams have any defense against snail predators? Ooh, that's a good question. They, they can move pretty quickly um, when they need to. You'd be surprised. I wish I had a video in here of a clam kind of pushing away with their, um, with their foot that they'll stick out of their shell. Um, and they also live really deep under the sand. So they're not typically towards the surface. Um, I do have, let's see if I can pull up. So here you can see some pictures of what clams look like most of the time when we see them alive. Um, and so these are clam siphons. It's the part that sticks out of their shell. And um, you'll often see these sticking up at low tide or if you walk in the shallows. Um, if you've ever been squirted while you're on a beach walk, this is likely the culprit right here, one of these clams. Um, through one of those tubes, it kind of looks like an elephant trunk with two nostrils kind of sticking up out of the sand. And one side is for pulling in the water and the other side is for squirting it back out. And so they'll pull that water in, they'll filter out any nutrients, um, they'll breathe, get any of the oxygen out of that water and then squirt out the leftovers. Um, and if a predator comes along or if you gently touch one of these siphons, you'll see them pull it back into the ground um, pretty quickly. So their shell and kind of hiding under the sand are their two main defenses. All right. Oh, thank you, Carly. I can see you've got it on our, our next find that we found. Um, hello, everyone. I am naturalist Kelly. And I, today, we found a um, purple sea star. So this is, you know, like those moon snails or some of those big things, which are always one of, you know, the favorites for everybody to find. There are quite a few of these purple or ochre sea stars at Seahurst Beach. Um, typically, we find these kind of nestled in amongst the rocks. So it's pretty rare that we find the one like this that is um, out in the open. But it really helps you see the shape of it. And then the... Um, Purple stars have that really cool bump. So I'm gonna get my, my fingers wet. And you can feel, when you, when you feel a purple star, these really kind of rock hard bumps that they have. And their legs are a lot fatter than some of the other stars we see on the beach. And you can also usually see a pretty distinct star shape right in the middle. And then I wanna point out one more thing this is white dot right here. So this is called the madreporite or the mother pore. And if we think of sea stars, one thing that we never want to do is we never want to try to pick them up because underneath they have all these tube feet, which are like little suction cups. And that's what they use to hold tight onto the rocks. And in fact, they can hold even upside down or sideways um, with all the waves crashing on it and they will not move. This madreporite actually pulls water in from around them and it helps power their, um, their, uh, their, their tube feet there. So they'll actually be pumping water in and out of their tube feet as they move along. And there's also a little bit of a glue too that's kind of cool. Um, another interesting thing about these sea stars is how they eat. And I don't know if we have any pictures of it, but there, I, or if you've talked about it at all tonight, but they're one of those creatures, like I've heard Alyssa say, you don't want to invite to your dinner table. Um, and that is because the sea stars, their mouth is located right underneath here, so at the bottom, and they actually pull their stomach. They pull open the shell, because they like to eat things like mussels and clams, and then they stick their stomach into the clam and digest whatever it is they're eating, and then they'll pull the whole thing back out. So it's like if you guys went to your dinner table 
and you opened your mouth and your stomach fell out of your mouth and onto your plate. You ate your food and then you slurped everything back up in. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, but that's another reason why you don't want to pull these sea stars off the rocks is because they may be in the middle of eating and their stomachs might be out. Um, some of you may have heard um, of a disease called sea star wasting disease. And it's affected sea stars in the Pacific Northwest and actually down um, the Pacific coast, even into California. So from like Alaska all the way down to California. And what happens is these sea stars, if you see them on the beach, they call it wasting disease because it looks like they're just wasting or melting away. And for many years, scientists thought that it was a virus potentially triggered or made worse through climate change and warming waters. And there was just a recent study that came out that suggested it actually was um, bacteria led. And so these, there's a lot more detritus because of climate change and all of that bacteria you know, eating the detritus is basically sucking the oxygen out of the water, and the sea stars are um, are getting asphyxia. They 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 cannot breathe, and so they will just go waste away. Now, this was just a very recent article that came out, the very first study of this. So, obviously, this is um, this is how science works. You know, people ask questions, they look for answers, and then. When new evidence presents itself, then they might find a new hypothesis. They might find a new suggestion. So it's kind of neat that, that scientists are working so hard to figure out why all of our sea stars um, are being affected by this disease. But this sea star here looks very healthy. So it's a great thing to find on a beach. Um, I think we might try to move to a new location. We've sort of seen most of the animals in this one little spot that we're in. So maybe we'll go ahead and mute and um, pass it back over to you, Alyssa. Sounds good. Thanks, Kelly. All right. I wanted to share um, some more pictures of sea stars. I know they're a fan favorite. Um, they're one of my favorites too, although if I keep saying that, everything will clearly be my favorite on the beach tonight. Um, but I think especially in this first image, you can see that madreporite that Kelly was pointing out really well. So it's that little kind of peachy um, polka dot right in the middle of that purple sea star. So again, that's the opening to their hydraulic system that really powers all of their movement. Um, and you can also see all of the sea stars on this. Most of them are purple, but we do have an orange one, um, which is the same species. So even though some folks call these by um, the common name purple star, they do come in multiple colors um, and they are all the same species. In this next picture, kind of closer up on them, these ones are in a very typical spot, kind of underneath the rocks where we will typically find them hiding from the sun, hiding from the elements at low tide, trying to stay nice and cool and moist. And you can also get a really good view of their tube feet. So those little white suction cups on the underside of the sea star that are just clinging um, to the underside of those rocks that are all part of that hydraulic system um, where their body is powered by that water that's sucked in. And um, you can also get a really good view of how just how kind of fuzzy these sea stars look. And that's because they actually breathe through their skin. So they have what's called dermal gills um, that will kind of come out of their skin, all these little tiny, almost paddle-like gills. Uh, it's the same way that their cousins, the sand dollars, breathe as well. So you want to be extra gentle um, when touching, again, any of these animals, but especially animals like sea stars or those sea slugs, the nudibranchs we discussed earlier, where their gills are literally on the back of their body. Um, so you want to touch them with wet, cold hands gently. There are quite a few other species of stars that you can see at our local beaches as well. We've got this beautiful bright orangish red blood star, um, which is a fun sight to see. Usually I see it a little bit deeper in the water, but you can find it um, at low tide. And another awesome sea star is um, in the bottom left-hand corner there, one of the sunflower sea stars that can have up to around 30 arms, pretty incredible. Um, they were hit especially hard by that sea star wasting disease that Kelly was telling us about. So 
I have not seen one on the beaches in a while. Um, I have seen them deeper under while diving, but yeah, they're definitely not as common as they were um, several years back. All right, let's check in um, with our naturalists and see if they're at a new location. And we did have a question about if they are also called okra stars, I believe. Like what's the difference between a purple star and an okra star, if I'm reading yeah. that right? Ochre stars and purple stars, that's the beauty of common names, right? So <laughs> they are, I learned them as ochre stars. Um, so yes, they are the same. Um, and I prefer, I prefer the name ochre star because again, they do come in colors other than purple. Um, although at Seahurst, most of the sea stars that we find are the purple uh, variety of the ochres. But yeah, great question. And they've also said it's a sea star, not a starfish, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I I um I don't go out of my way to correct people. If you want to call it a starfish, by all means call it a starfish. Um, I think you'll just find that most people in the scientific community tend to call them sea stars um, because they are not at all related to fish and sometimes it confuses people, um, especially kiddos when you call them starfish might think that they're actually fish um, when they are invertebrates. They do not have a backbone like fish do. So they're really not related to fish at all. Hello everybody, this is Joanna out here on the beach. We've got another view of a sea star on the rock here hanging on tight with its two feet. And we're also showing you a relative of a sea star. We've got a burrowing sea cucumber. It's a bright orange sea cucumber. It's got the same symmetry of a sea star and they've got a pretty good life. You can see it moving around ever so slightly in its little home there. They wait for the tide to come in and they can reach out and grab their lunch as it floats on by a pretty good life for our burrowing sea cucumber. Um, there's other species of sea cucumbers that when they get really alarmed, they're able, like if they have a predator lurching behind them, they can actually eviscerate all of their insides. And so the predator says, oh, these insides, these guts are delicious. And they'll eat the insides and then swim away. And the sea cucumber is able to regenerate all of the insides. So I'm gonna see if I, this one's kind of hankering down the rock. We're gonna see if we can get a little better view for you all. Awesome, I'm also, I'm gonna pull up um, some pictures on my end as well. So you can get a clear idea of what uh, we're looking at here. So these little burrowing sea cucumbers are a really dependable find at Seahurst. Um, and like Joanna said, they're often down in the cracks and crevices. Um, this, the image that's closer in here, you can really see its feeding tentacles on the bottom. So the head end in this picture is oriented down. And so you can see kind of just the beginnings of those feeding tentacles coming out. And when it's fully open and underwater, it really looks like a beautiful orange flower. Um, these sea cucumbers are detritivores. So they kind of just eat everybody's leftovers. I always think of them as kind of the vacuum cleaners or the Roombas of the tide pools, just cruising around, cleaning up after everybody else. Um, and one kind of cool thing too that you might notice in this picture are those rows of dark red kind of tube feet coming down um, all around this sea cucumber's body. So there are other species of cucumbers that only have their feet on the bottom, kind of like you would expect. Um, but because this is a burrowing variety and they live in crevices, they have those rows of feet all around their body, 360 all the way around, um, which is a pretty cool adaptation. And speaking of adaptations, there's a question if um, sea cucumbers burrow. Yes, this variety um, does burrow. They're typically in the rocks, um, but there are other cucumbers that will kind of go into the sand. Um, and then there are others that live right on top as well. So yeah, it just depends on um, kind of their niche in the habitat um, that they're able to 
fulfill. So around here, most of the times you'll find our burrowing cucumbers in kind of cracks and crevices in the rocks. That's a really great place um, to look for them. And of course, for sea stars as well as you're exploring the beaches. We also have a question of what sea cucumbers are related to. That is another great question. I will share my screen again um, because they are what we call echinoderm, which means spiny skin. So echinoderms or spiny skinned animals includes not only the sea cucumbers um, that are really kind of bumpy but squishy, uh, but also sea stars, which Kelly was pointing out all those little bumps or pedicles along the back of the sea stars, but also sand dollars. Um, so these groups are all kind of like cousins to one another. They're in the same phylum. Um, and these are some sand dollars that I'm not sure that we'll spot any tonight. It's so difficult to find them even during the day. Um, but they're uh, all around at Seahurst. And you can kind of tell when you look at the shell of a sand dollar that's passed away, like this bright white one um, in the top right corner, that kind of flower shape on their back is a little hint to you that they are cousins to the sea stars. Um, so yeah, so sand dollars, sea stars, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins as well are all in that echinoderm or spiny skinned family. And since we were talking about things that okay. had hard shells, it seems like we may have found another one on the beach that has a hard shell. What's going on out there? Yeah, we found another little scavenger hiding under the rocks here, a red rock crab. So this red rock crab looks kind of large. Rosie, can you put your hand next to it to get a kind of a scale of just how large it is? But you don't want to get too close because it does have very strong pincers, pincers that could cut, that they're designed to cut through shells and scavenge little bits of leftovers and clams that maybe the sea star didn't eat or leftovers in the mussel. And you know with the red rock crab, it's got tip, red, black tips on the very end of its pincers. And it's just hunkering down in there waiting for some sort of prey to come by. You can see the its feeding parts moving around ever so slightly. So this crab looks very large with Rosie's scale, but it did not start off out that way. Sometimes you see what looks like dead crabs all over the beach, but they're actually molts of when that crab was growing up. So when it was a younger crab, it had a much smaller shell, and unlike us, when our clothes get, start to feel too tight or our shoes start to feel too tight, we can go buy new clothes. But crabs, they have to open up their shell, climb out the back, and grow a whole new leg coverings, eye coverings, even new, even new gill covers as well. So this is some pretty mature red rock crab here. I don't know if it's coming through on um, your all's end here, but we also can hear some vertebrates. There are some herons that are fishing right behind us and squawking and diving and splashing. And so we will see if we get you all a good shot of that. But um, as we move to our next organism, any questions about, oh, cool, Jackie found a molt here. So you can see as they grow bigger, they open up that hinge on their carapace, climb out the back. So this is not a dead crab. This is their old shell. And a dungeness on this one. It doesn't have those black tips on the very end of its pincers. Wow. So as we move to, I know we only have a few minutes left here. So as we move to our next organism, any other questions about the red rock crab? While we're waiting um, for questions, I wanted to show a picture of a crab that was caught in the act right in the middle of molting. Um, so you can see on the left side here, that is another red rock crab. He's got those black tip um, pincers like Joanna mentioned, and he is in the act of crawling out of his shell. They'll kind of suck in water after that point to kind of inflate their body, make it a little bit bigger uh, so that they can grow their new shell. 
And um, there's a really great picture here as well of a juvenile crab. And this is again, just the molt of the crab. So like Joanna mentioned, it's not dead. It's just an empty shell. They do not smell like a dead crab. Um, and you can just kind of pop that back right off like Jackie did. And you can see like Joanna mentioned as well that they leave behind their gill covers. So those little peachy kind of um, little squishy piles on either side inside of that empty molt are the gill covers. So pretty amazing um, to spot these along the beach. So don't worry when you see a bunch of what you think are dead crabs on the beach because the odds are a lot of them are molts. And that's a great sign because uh, crabs need to molt right before they reproduce in a lot of cases. So that's a sign of a healthy ecosystem with lots of growing animals. And Alyssa, a second ago, you said he. Can you share on how you can tell if it's a he or a she? Yes, I wish I had a picture of this queued up, um, but I don't. <laughs> but on the underside um, of a crab, their belly plate will either be a skinny little triangle or a big wide belly plate. Um, and as you can probably imagine, that big wide belly plate is what a female needs to carry her eggs. So if a female is gravid and she's got all of her little eggs with her, um, she'll carry them right in that plate and you'll actually typically see it bulging with eggs. So you can see her little eggs developing in there and if they're close to hatching, sometimes you can even see their eyes. So again, if you gently take a look at that belly plate, a big wide belly plate is a female and a skinny triangular belly plate is a male. Perfect, thank you. We don't have any more questions on the crab, but we do have a couple more questions as we're closing here. One was about the sand dollars earlier, um, asking if they look white, are they no longer alive? And if that's the case, could you pick them up to look at them? Yes, so if you see a sand dollar that is white on the beach, that is a test or an empty shell of a sand dollar. You can definitely pick that up um, and take a closer look. When they are alive, they're kind of a blackish purple color and they almost look velvety because of all their little spines and feet. Um, if you do pick up a sand dollar shell to take a look at it, just make sure that you put it back uh, before you leave because they are made of calcium carbonate, which is the same things that um, lots of hard structures, including uh, snail shells are made out of. So we wanna get that back in the environment so that it can break down into those little building blocks that a new snail or crab or sand dollar will be using to build their own shell anew. Oh, and speaking of shells, how long does it take a crab to grow in your shell? Um, so usually from the time that they molt to the time that their new shell hardens is around a week or so. It depends on the species and the size of the crab, um, but it's usually one to two or three weeks and they will spend that time hidden under a rock, um, typically hidden away. There are some species of crabs that actually migrate so that they can all molt in an area with thousands of other crabs so that predators are overwhelmed and they can't tell who has a soft shell and who has a hard shell and their safety um, in numbers. All right, we've got another crab here that we didn't want to get too close to. We're not sure if it's dead or alive or a molt, but what I wanted to draw, what we wanted to draw your all's attention to is it looked like somebody sneezed on this rock and these are actually a kind of anemones called plumos anemones. So anemones made very famous by finding Nemo. That's where Nemo likes to hide. But if you're not a clownfish, you can certainly get stung by anemones. They are related to jellies and they have stinging cells on their tentacles. And so if uh, many fish swim through an anemone, they get stung and the anemone can pull that um, shrimp or fish into their body to eat them. Um, but this was just a, we thought this was a really cool look at our plumos anemone here. They like to hang down on the rock like this, um, different from some of our aggregating or green anemones that we see sitting more upright on a rock. We wanted to see if we could capture that heron that was still stalking and fishing out here. I know we were almost out of time, but we have a very not shy heron hanging out with us here, stalking fish. Every so often we see a flash, or a splash, excuse me. 
Yeah, that ghost image may be the heron just waiting out there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and we did Might have a question. Through this iPad. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of that, we had the question of, can you see things different at low tide if you're going out in the day versus nighttime? That's an awesome question. I can answer just what we're observing right now. We're seeing some creatures forage more at night. There aren't as many of our diurnal or daytime predators out here hunting. So some of our shrimp and some of our smaller fish and even some of our kelp crabs, if we have time, we could show you some of the kelp crabs we've been seeing are super active at night when some of those um, larger predators are resting than they are during the day. Good question. Yep, and we had just a couple more questions to be wrap about how many nudibranchs can reliably be found in tide pools? <laughs> I don't know if um, Joanna has an answer to this one, but I think, I mean, there are, there are lots of different types of nudibranchs that you can find around here. I would say the most common species that I see are opalescence, um, lemon, which are the ones that we looked at earlier, the shaggy mouse, which is the one that they found in the field, um, and then lemon dorids, which kind of look like a like a banana peel. They're yellow with brownish spots on them. Um, I would say those are the three most common that I find pretty regularly tide pooling, um, but I don't know if any of our naturalists in the field uh, have some other nudibranch knowledge that they want to add for common nudibranchs you can find reliably around here. Megan mouse and opalescent are ones that we most commonly find here. And sometimes you see their eggs first. So you see what looks almost like ramen noodles all over a rock. And then you know there's a nudibranch nearby. The nudibranchs are very good at camouflaging, but some of their eggs are not as camouflaged on a rock. <laughs> and, and I also don't know. Barnacle eating doors, which are super good at hiding. Um, they are a lot out here, but you have to be really, that's what I love about tide pooling is that the slower you go and the closer you zoom in on a rock, the more animals you see. And there was one animal I don't know if you saw, but was asked about um, gooey ducks. Um, were asked about can they get entirely inside of their shells and also if there's commercial gooey duck harvesting at Seahurst Park. Alyssa, do you know the logistics of that, if a gooey duck can get entirely inside its shell? Yeah, so I have never seen one get <laughs> entirely inside of their shell. Um, they're always kind of hanging out, at least a few inches of them is hanging out. Gooey ducks also, I think their primary defense really is that they're always several feet down underneath the sand. Um, so they don't typically need to get all the way into their shell, unlike some other species like, um, you know, little nut clams, for instance, that live a lot closer um, to the surface and other clams that are more kind of apt to be moving around on the benthos or on the sea floor at high tide. Um, so yeah, I have never seen one get all the way inside its shell. Um, and as for, as for uh, harvesting them at Seahurst, um, you cannot harvest them unless um, you are a tribal member. As far as I'm aware, you cannot harvest um, anything at Seahurst Beach. It, it is a protected area. And I think tribal member or um, Washington Fish and Wildlife um, may also have permits. And the last time we talked to them about that, they said gooey ducks are actually, um, they're managed more like forests are managed as far as harvesting goes. So that's why you may see a boat out there in a patch because they're only going out for that one patch as if harboring, you know, harvesting timber for that session. And we have seen the boats out usually in winter and spring. Um, so if you see some, it could be Washington, uh, Washington um, wildlife or it could be a tribal um, group. So that's a great question. 
And if you're out there in the dark, I hope it's just a naturalist and no one else <laughs> since the park is closed. Um, but you can see lots of different things at different low tides. And we're so thankful that even though you weren't on the beach, you were still joining along in this manner. We hope you learned a lot and that you can also join us again because we have two more of these sessions going. And as you know, you may never see the same thing when you go out to the beach. So you're welcome to join us again next month in February on February 6th on a Saturday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And then on that Sunday, February 7th from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And if you can't make these, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. So we will go ahead and post the recordings and hopefully continue this conversation about all these great species. So I wanna thank everybody for being on the beach for us and taking us all along. And thank you all for asking questions and caring so much as you do. Thank you all for joining us out here. Some really great questions. We really appreciate your all's interest and and exploring with us in this way. And we look forward to a time we can all be out here again together. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. I hope you've been inspired to go uh, exploring on your own as well. Yeah, so maybe we will see you virtually, um, but we will give you a low tide, low five, high five virtually, and see you later. Thanks, y'all. A low again. tide, high five. <laughs> <laughs>